Forty days have passed since Tutankhamun's death. Time is running out. In another 30 days, he will be ready for burial. It takes a long time to melt. Egyptologist Salima Ikram is mummifying a sheep to demonstrate the oddities in King Tut's mummy. Like this sheep, Tut's organs have been removed and his body has dried out. Now Ikram covers the sheep in oil. Tutankhamun would have had the best quality oils, and you use the oils not just because you are doing something that is sacred, but also because it gives some flexibility back to the body. So by oiling Tutankhamun, you, were, so you could position his arms in the royal pose and make sure that his arms didn't snap off. Next, Ikram seals the body with heated resins, usually frankincense and myrrh. As the body takes on a golden sheen, Pharaoh is transformed from human to divine. But once again, King Tut's mummification is unusual. The quantities of resin used are excessive. Why Tutankhamun had so much resin and oil on him is not very clear. Um, was it to hide a bad quality mummification? And maybe it was sort of a combination of, I am so sorry we messed up. Um, here, have some extra resin. Or um, it was also to say, <clears throat> bits are not as they should be, so let's cover it up so no one can actually see this and criticize it. Whatever the reason, the outcome was clear. His body was effectively carbonized. I just can feel the heat going through to my hand. So it's, if they were using a lot of very hot resin, it's no wonder that Tutankhamun, in fact, became rather roasted in appearance. The ultimate act performed within the final 30 days is to wrap the body in linen. At last, Ikram discovers something worthy of a pharaoh. Even if the mummification had not been good, certainly the wrapping section was very well done to a large extent, and it was lavish. The mummification of the sheep is complete. Tut's mummy will be laid to rest in a magnificent coffin of solid gold. His body is further protected by another two coffins, nesting one within the other. The three will lie within a stone sarcophagus in his second-hand tomb. By 1450 BC, royal sarcophagi were elaborate and intricately carved. Tuts is quartzite and a work of beauty. But experts Marianne Eaton Krauss and Dennis Stocks have been examining it, and all is not as it seems. Could such an intricate work of art have been produced within the 70-day deadline? The answer may be found here, York Minster, England, the largest Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe. It takes the work of 25 stonemasons and carvers to maintain this building. Today, experimental archaeologist Dennis Stocks has set one of them a challenge. When you look at it closely, it appears naive in style, but the actual workmanship that's gone into it is absolutely superb. It's a real piece of fantastic craftsmanship. Stone carver Dave Willett has chosen to carve the face of the goddess Isis from a corner of the sarcophagus. Then he and Stocks will attempt to estimate how long it might have taken the original carvers to produce the entire box. And if you look at the subtlety of the carving, so it's pretty round the eye, and certainly on the lips, absolutely beautifully worked. Yes. Where the lips curled over at the bottom, yeah, that would take quite a bit of work to achieve that. It would, yes. Willett normally works with limestone. The challenge is how he'll cope with quartzite, one of the hardest stones on earth. First, he tries one of his modern steel chisels. That's it. Oh, yes. Fairly efficient. He chiffed quite a bit with that. But even so, even so. But it does wear it down pretty quickly. Wear it down a little bit. Yes. Next, he tries a chisel made of bronze, a material used by the ancient Egyptians. Oh, 
hardly touches it. But Willett won't be using either of these tools. Stock's years of research on ancient stoneworking techniques suggests the Egyptians used chisels made of flint. Certainly more efficient than the that bronze. That seems to be working very well. Compared to the bronze, so, it's brilliant. Yeah. Even on this very hard stone, it's quite clear that you really need a stone tool you to do. work stone. Yes, definitely. Willett gets to work. The goddess's face is carved in relief, so once sketched out, he must remove all the background. It promises to be a laborious job. Well, I think it's so different to use a tool made of stone rather than a tool made of steel. This is going to find it quite challenging at the beginning until he gets used to it. I think he's going to have to learn to be a stonemason all over again. Back in Egypt, Marianne Eaton Krauss is also investigating Tut's sarcophagus. For years, she's studied photographs, puzzled by inconsistencies in the carving of the four-winged goddesses. These figures would lead her to an amazing discovery. If we start here at the head end of the sarcophagus, we can see the incredible amount of detail that has been lavished on these figures. We see the, the necklace, which has been done in relief. Here, even the knot shown in the strap of the dress also the navel, and the way the foot has been done in the anklets. But the foot end of the box is very different. We'll see the goddess Selkit, and we will see here many of the same um, details, but executed only in paint. And she has no navel. Well, it's quite clear that the head end is much more finished. The foot end has only been finished in paint in a rather hurried fashion. Back at York Minster, stone carver Dave Willett is beginning to understand why some parts are more finished than others. It's taken him 50 hours simply to take out the background and shape the face in relief. But he's discovering too how the ancient Egyptians may have produced the sarcophagus and what they went through to do it. Using the granite pounders, I think, is how they must have taken out larger areas because it's so much more efficient than using the um, flints. But it's incredibly hard work. They must have been absolutely exhausted and incredibly fit to be doing this all day. Experimental archaeologist Dennis Stocks is trying to estimate how long it might have taken to produce the whole sarcophagus. Before carving even began, his research suggests the ancient Egyptians would have first drilled out the interior of the quartzite block. By using tubular drills of copper, with a bow to turn it, the sand abrasive for the drilling out, and with three teams working eight hours a day, I think it would take about 536 days, which is equal to about 18 months. Finally, after almost four weeks of carving, Willett finishes the goddess. Wow! It stands right out at you, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's a wonderful job. It really is. You know, I, I think it's amazing that you can produce such a level of detail with such a tiny piece of flint. It is quite incredible, really. Uh, when I first started, I thought, no way would flints be able to do this, but it certainly opened my eyes to what skill and craftsmanship they had in ancient Egypt. Using his work as a guide, Willett estimates it would have taken one man almost six years to carve the entire sarcophagus. But evidence suggests the box was the work of a team of craftsmen. How many men would you think could work at the same time around you the sarcophagus? You could probably get about eight or ten round. Well, suppose we say about ten. That will um... bring it down to about eight months. So the sarcophagus could not have been carved in the 70-day deadline. Tut would have needed to have commissioned it before he died. 
but Eaton Krauss's research has led her to think there could be another explanation. I noticed something that was very surprising to me, uh, namely there were traces of earlier inscriptions. If you look very closely, you will see here is a rounded sign that was part of one of the Egyptian words for eternity. And here at the bottom, you also see the sign for T, the letter T, and here a line across the bottom. And right beside it, you will see very little bit here of a line. This was originally the register line that continued all the way up here. This suggests the inscriptions for Tut mask earlier hieroglyphs. And the goddess's wings prove to be even more revealing. It's quite clear that the wings are a later addition because there are traces of hieroglyphs here that were in columns that went also up to the top. The wings served a dual purpose for the stonemasons. They hid the original inscriptions and there was less service to reinscribe. I would suggest it was a practical solution that this decision had been taken simply because it was a time saver. Her findings bring her to a dramatic conclusion. I am convinced that the sarcophagus was not commissioned for Tutankhamun, but that it was made for one of his predecessors. Tutankhamun already had a hand-me-down tomb. If the sarcophagus was not even his, maybe the rest of his famous treasures never belonged to him at all.